Okay, okay. I think I've got it. Okay, so uh, as a micro student, soft run student ambassador and a GitHub campus expert, there isn't any other better topic to talk about than Git. And aside from being affiliated with those ones, I think that as a software developer or someone with an interest in software development, knowing about Git is something beneficial to your career and to your daily life, either at work or at school. Have you knowing how it operates helps you in doing your day-to-day -day operations without hustling and blaming the wrong things. So today I'm going to talk about Git internals. So let's start. So we might start with what is Git. Uh, I don't know the demographer who is attending if they are, they are intermediate, advanced or novices, but I'm going to talk as if we have some fundamentals of software development. So Git can be compared to another database. So if you are a developer, you are aware that there are some databases like relational databases like MySQL, Olaco, and other ones. Git is also another database, but a different one. It is distributed. Distributed means that it is not centralized in one location, like on the MySQL that you can access from your exam or another one that you can access using different tools. This one is distributed in such a way that it is in every developer. You have it at your local machine and your colleague, your peer, the one that you are working with, have it on his machine also. So it is distributed. Aside from being distributed, there are also some relational databases that are distributed. That doesn't mean that they are the same as JIT. So here are some basic concepts that you can compare with the database and Git. So in Git, the data is persisted to the disk. So whatever you are doing, when you are committing, when you are checking, whatever you are doing, you are interacting with the data that is persisted to your disk. And you, both of the databases, employee queries to retrieve basic information about data. And that data that is being stored can be optimized so that it can be retrieved efficiently. In relation databases, we can use indexes and other methods to make sure that we have optimized our queries. And in Git, there are other methods of optimizing the queries. That is another thing that the databases and Git share. So we also know that the relation databases have algorithms that they employ to make sure that they are taking our advantage of when optimizing. And since it is distributed, we need to synchronize between all of those nodes that are storing data. We know that you are storing data at your machine. Another one is storing it. Another one is storing it. We need synchronization between all those databases so that they can have a single source of truth. They can have a common state. So that is about Git as a distributed database. Continuing, we can then go on the differences between Git and those other databases. We know, we saw that they both have queries, they persist data to the disk, they have several similarities, but also they have differences. The first difference is that Git uses short-lived processes that uses the file system to persist the data between executions. Unlike MySQL or Oracle or other databases, MongoDB or another kind of that uses long-lived processes. So when you do something uh, using Git, a process is spawned that carry, carries out that task and it is terminated as soon as it finishes that. But in uh, other relation database, we don't do that. We have uh, something like a wrong polling, a process that is long lived, that is listening for something to happen so that when you query, it does that, but at the end, when it finishes, it doesn't stop there. It continues being in, during execution. That is the first difference. The second difference is that Git types are a bit restrictive than our typical application databases. 
in MySQL, we have very cards. We have a lot of data types. In, I know that in Postgres, we have JSONB. We can store JSON data. In MongoDB, restrictions are little. And in other databases, we have a lot of data types that we can use to store our data. But when we come back to JIT, we have restrictions on which data types you can use. So this is about the differences and the similarities between Git. As in now we are, we know that Git is essentially a database that is distributed in each developer's PC and uh, some other remote location that acts as a common state, a single source of truth, which can be GitHub, which can be GitLab, which can be Bitbucket or something else. Okay. So if you've used JIT, before you can start working with the commands and memorizing, committing, merging, libasing, and other and other different commands, it's better to know which areas are there, which areas that Git has. So, uh, okay, okay, what happened? Tried presenting, okay, and it doesn't allow me to. Ah, uh, great. Okay, so Git has four areas that you work with. Let's say that you initiated a project, your files and everything will go through four areas. The first area is the working area. The working area is where you are working. When you initiate and you start coding or doing something else, that area that you are working on is the working area. And after you've done something and you are sure that you want to move it to a different area, there is an index. So an index stores files that are ready to be put to the repository. So the repository is another area. So you are working, you say that something that I have been working on is ready, you put it on the side, this is the index. This is where you, you put it. And after you put it on the index, you come back and you say that, okay, these things that I've prepared, I'm ready to commit them, I'm ready to put them to the repository. So you put them to the repository. So I'm saying that there are four areas, but usually they, they were three. But as it progressed, another one was introduced, which is the stash area. You can move the files between the working area, the index, the repository, and also the stash. The stash is the temporary area where you can store the files that you don't want in the working area, index, or the repository. So after these four areas that we have, there are lots of all, all the commands that we have in Git can be expressed as moving data from left to right or from right to left, moving data from one area to another. So from data to the right is from working area to the index to the repository. That is the right. So from the left is from the repository to the index to the working area. So that would be the mental model, uh, the mental mapping of those. So we have like, for example, we have like git add. Git add is taking a file from the working area to the index. So that is from left to right. And commit can take it from that working, from that index to the repository. And we have other commands that can take data from left we have checkout we use checkout to switch between branches or to check out just like one single file so we are moving from the index to a working area or from one part of the repository to another we can reset we can remove something so we are taking something from here to here from left to right so this is the git file structure after looking at the Git areas and Git as a database, then we can inspect the Git structure. In case anyone has been curious enough to look inside it, when you look inside Git, this is what you are going to find. You are going to find something like this. You are going to find one folder of lifts, another folder of objects, another folder of hooks, uh, uh, info, logs. You are going to have several files, one that is called head, lots of files that are there. 
And in the case you've wondered before what is inside those files, then we are going to look at some of it. So Git is something big. I'm not sure that we can look at each one and every one of the files in here, but we are going to do our best and check out some of them. Okay. So inside one of those folder is the Git objects. This is the object store. And we have another one that is in Git left. So there is this lefts, which means references, and there is these objects. They are stored in this one. So the object store stored stores the object ID and the object data. So we'll see this further in the presentation, whether whether it is a commit, a blob, or a tree. And we have something else, which is the reference store. Stores the reference name and the object ID. It is the reference because you see that this object ID is pointing to another object store in our Git database, in our Git local databases. So, so that we can continue to look into this, we can utilize some of Git commands. We know a lot of Git commands, but these commands are placed in two types. The first type is the post lane commands. These are the ones that we use in our data lives as software developers. We add, we remove, we blanch, we check out, we switch, we merge, we libase, we cherry pick, we do everything. These are the post lane commands. But there are other commands, which are the plumbing commands, which are the one, these are the commands that we don't usually use. As the name suggests, they, they are the plumbing commands. These ones, you use them for plumbing, for plumbing with Git. And here are some of the examples of those files. We have like cat file, we have check ignore, and we are going to use some of these files that are layerly used to better understand how Git works, what is stored in those objects by using these plumbing commands. And you can also use them yourselves. It doesn't mean that because they are called the plumbing commands, they belong to someone. No, if you have Git installed, then you can play around with them, use them. Some of the plumbing commands. So you see, we have a lot of li a long list of these commands, but we are going to be using mostly cat file. There is also another one which is called hash file. Yes, hash object, cat file, hash object. There is this update index, write tree, but we are going to be using cat file and hash object mostly. So we have these hash objects. This takes a command, the file content, and writes it into a blob. A blob is the contents of your file. A blob is, if you're writing a text and you saw it in GitHub, that is the blob. If you have a video, it's a blob. The file that you have is a blob. Okay, uh, okay, this, 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 uh, I have it as hash object, but this is cat file. Cat file is the one that we do the object lookup and provide the necessary information. Okay. So let's talk about these object types and try to use cat file and hash object to better understand them. So we have uh, the blob. As I was saying, the blob is the one that is used to store a file, generally a file, regardless of which type of file. You, in Git, it is generally not recommended to use to store videos or large files, but if you store them, nothing is going to happen. It's going to take awfully long time. You're going to wait hours to push or pull, but it's going to be able to store it. But the text files, your code files, your .ts, your .java files, they are blobs to Git. Doesn't care about the extension. If it is whatever, it is just a blob. So this is a readme file that you see here. This is a blob. Another rec file, a blob. So aside from this blob, we also have a tree. A tree is a directory, is your folder in Windows and a directory to those who are familiar with the Linux or Unix environment. So this tree contains other trees and blobs. So we have this tree, which is a folder that contains one file that is called simple git dot ruby or something. 
and we higher up we have this parent which is another tree so it is recursive in this way it's a recursive tree that stores trees and other blob files aside from this tree and blob we also have a commit a commit is nothing else but a point to a single tree we have this tree we come and we point we say that this we're going to name this something this is a command this is the, the commit so that as the people who uses the systems it's going to be easier for us to know what took place at each time we're going to say that this tree we mark it we say that this but this is the person who've done it this is the changes this is the parent and the, everything about it that is a commit a commit is also another object type aside from the commit we also has a tag so a commit is pointing to to a single tree so a tag is also pointing to a specific command so that we can mark it as special for some way it is used by maintainers of open source projects or even not open source as a release say that we are doing a, a project with release version one version two version three we tag it target that we say that this is the release version something a minor a major a breaking change or something we target okay so uh, let, let's see if we can use these some of these commands that we've seen okay let me share the my Uh, okay. Okay, I hope you were able to see my terminal. I uh, check. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, let me make a directory and say that. Mm. <laughs> By that naming. Okay. And if we, we go in there, we can do git in it. And now we've initialized a git. And as I've said, we now have that hidden directory. That is, uh, okay, let me uh, go in there and do git in it again. And we can see that we've all initialized an empty git repository. This is an empty git repository that we haven't started installing history, but we surely do have some things in our dot git. So if we list, uh, we list all the hidden files, okay, shouldn't have put on permission. We see that we have a dot git. We have that folder. And if, uh, let, me, let me see if we can find all the, the electoral is there. Okay, doesn't want type. You can see all the things that I store there. We have the hooks, we have the info, we have the objects, we have the lips. All these are the the electrolytes that we saw that were there in the image. We have this as the head, the description. These are the files, and these are the directories. They are there, we haven't done anything, but they are there since we initialized this as a Git repository. So now we can use the command that we've seen that is the plumbing ones to store something in Git. Okay, let's say that we, okay, 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 studying Git. And we pipe this into the hash object. We write it to a file. Uh, let's not write it to a file. Let's write it from the standard input. Okay. So you see that when we use this, it gives us back the uh, SHA, the checksum that we are going to use to retrieve that file. This is what Git does inside. So we, we've taken this this contents and we've hashed them from the standard input. I could have even written a file and saved it and 
use to get, get hash object to parse it as a file, but this is much faster. So now we have this hash of the contents that we just stored by using git hash. As we saw that we have another command, which is git cut file. We can use this cut file to see information about this hash. This is the same hash that you have for the commits for everything when you, dig, you do git log, git leaf log. So let's use git cut file. Can use t to know the type of this hash we have. You see that it is telling us that this is a blob. And we saw that the blob is a file, a regular file that you have, a general file that you have. So we can use another command, another command option that isn't type, can use p, see the contents of that hash. So now we are able to see the contents of this hash. And if we go inside the git repository and also list everything in there, you can see that we know the head. The head is storing what? Let's, let's try to see what, what is inside head. Okay, so how to... Let me open it with notepad, no problem. Ah, the thing is that you're going to be able to see it. Okay, let me use Vim. Okay, this is what is inside the head. The head is pointing to where we currently are. And where are we? We are in the master. We haven't talked about anything about branches, but this is where head is pointing. Okay, uh, no, nah, I shouldn't be doing this. Let me just quit. Okay, and if we list all of them, we, we, there are the configs, we do have the configs, which are the configuration for our Git. So if we look inside here, we are going to see the file mode, the Lego leaf updates, the system link, the ignore case. So if we add some other configurations, they are going to be put inside there. So if we do like, like git mm, config without global, you say that user.name is Kevin Lukundo. Uh, let me hope that it is config. You can see that we have another section of user and it is describing the name as Kevin Lukundo. It is the here because I haven't added the global option that we usually add. If I've added it, it wouldn't be there. It would rather be in another configuration file that we have in a git. Okay, uh, not a directory. We can open it in Vim. We have another global git config that we use for our whole system, but we can overwrite everything in this global with what we have in our specific git repository, git config. So you have, you see, I have configured some aliases to make it easier for what I do. I have um, set up the editor. You can see we are using this code inside us as the editor, the email and the names. So you can have these configurations, but you also do have them inside your local git, git config file. The description is self-explanatory. It is the description of your files. We have the hooks which can run before commit, before push, before build, and everything. And we have info, objects, and references. The important things are the objects and the references. We saw that objects, they store the contents, and the references, they store the references to the other objects that are special in which ways. So if we go inside the objects, but even if we wouldn't, we can find all the files in here. You can see that inside these objects, we do have the commit that we generated. We do have the hash that we generated using our hash object. So this is where it is stored. Okay. So I'm going to go back and I'm not 
inside the git now that you've seen how we can use hash object and cat file we can use other types of jumping commands to do other interesting things we can use the update index to now store the tree what we have is a blob we, we don't you know, even know the file name let me see if i still have it the cat file git cut file dash p if i do have yes okay you can see we have the contents and if we add the t we know that uh, i added the z if we added the t we know that the type is the blob but we don't have the we don't have the the name so if we want to store the name then we're going to need to use git uh, update index so that we can be able to store the tree or uh, as we saw the tree which stores the references to the other trees or blobs so let's let's try it let's try it let's say that we update this index so i will share the references so that people can go and look up and read more about these files about these commands and the several options they can take this weird number is the mode which describes what we are storing the type of the file it is the plumbing command this is the reason why we don't use it usually because it doesn't care about the convenience of someone who is using it hence the modes and the numbers and everything so here we are taking everything in our staging and we are creating a tree from it so error it is expecting a mod and i've given it a mod but it doesn't want it okay so how do i do it how do i do it let's say that i add the file okay Mm, okay let's let's use the normal one let's create a file let me create a file okay and we insert we say that this is a new file and quickly we save it after saving it we are able to see and we can use git status to see that this file is unattracted it is still in a working area in location so we can use one of the commands that move data from the left to the right which is add since we have one file we can add all so now that we've added all it is in the staging area we can add it to the index by committing we say that added file now it is from the staging area to the index and now if we do a log we can see something which is a commit and we're going to use our command which is cut file and we are going to paste the commit so that the type is a commit now that we know the type is a commit what is inside a commit you can see the author kevin lukundo the, the committer the message and the tree and when we take this tree and we look inside the, the tree also you see okay if we paste we are going to see that the tree is storing a leaflets to a blob file so to reach inside this blob file we are going to also paste this and we see the contents of this one of the file so this is the process that you go through to reach inside the file so but if you aren't going to do this you are going to use uh postline commands but knowing that it happens like this and what is inside a commit what is inside what helps helps you so let's go back to the presentation and look at other things aside from the objects types and the staging areas okay
let me share again the presentation and where is it okay okay we're on the object types now we can go to the branches we saw that there is a uh, left what are the lips and what are they stalling one of what they are stalling are the branches and branches are nothing but references to commit we saw that you can tag a commit and say that this commit is stalling specific information a release or something you can also tag it in some other way and say that this is this is the branch this is where the our branch is our branch is at this level at this level is another branch so these are the branches they just point to a specific commit the difference is that they can change the tags are not going to change the commits that they, they point to but branches do how do we know the current branch we can look inside the lists i think I can be sharing, I can share the whole screen so that I can move between the terminal and the presentation easier. So how do we know the current? Okay, let's look inside git, say lefts, say heads. Okay, inside the refs, if you see here, you can see which file, current file is opened. You can see that inside Git, the difference is heads. Heads are the pointers of where all the branches are pointing. We know, so we know that the branches are pointing to commit and where they are pointing, it is stored in heads. So we have Git, references, heads. Inside the heads, we have all the branches and which commits they are pointing to. So this branch is pointing to that commit. And if we do git log, we're going to see that this is head. The master is pointing to this commit. If I was to create another branch and check it out, say that branch two, for instance, and we do git log, we saw that we see that both of them are pointing at the same commit. But if I if I let's do a call file in branch two and we pipe it to file two dot text okay doesn't want that uh all is we pipe this to this we do status and we add it and we commit it we say that we added file in branch two and we do git log, you are going to see that now head of the branch two is pointing to this to this commit. And the head of the master is pointing to a previous commit. And this is, if we, let, let, let's go inside the lefts, heads, and list all of the contents of this directory. You can see that we have all those branches. What we are seeing from the terminal is what is being read from these files. If you read this file, branch, you are going to see that they are showing the commit they are referencing. So this makes the branches easier. So there isn't even the mention of branches. There isn't even the idea of branches. If you look really, there are commits and references. So you have the history that is there and some pointers that aren't even real, that are pointing somewhere. It isn't like we are going to take a branch on the side and continue. And when we merge, we are merging the same branches together. No, it is just commits. And we have the status of something called a detached head. So we know that head is always pointing to the current branch, but it can be detached can be detached say let's say that we are we are we are in branch two and we want to check out something we can use check out to check out a branch or a commit 
can do check out and we do this commit okay and when i paste it looks like this for god's sake let me fix it and do this must it be run in a work file so this is it why am i not git log okay i'm inside git repository and they're telling me that i shouldn't be running this inside there okay you can see that i'm able to check out this commit but they are telling me that i'm in detached head which means that where america where i am currently now there is no branch that is pointing to this area that we are currently on whatever we are doing here won't be able to be tracked we won't be able to track whatever we are going to be doing in this detached head we can be safe and go back to our branch which is easier to name so now we are not detached we are we have put head to the position where it was so this is what we call detached head so merging how does merging work if you are able to see the images this is what imagine works we have one commit two commits three commits and during this commit we create another branch that creates different commits and another one continues working and have another commit when we say that we want to merge we create one commit that has two parents so this is merging merging isn't in good alone if you're not talking about libase so this is libase how does it work it takes this commit that you have you have this workflow this timeline that you are you are taking someone branched out and created other two commits when you have want to libase them instead of creating one commit with two parents it copies everything that was here and places them in on top of the head of the branch you are libasing on okay but in reality this is when this is the problem when you do a rebase and you try to push and they tell you that it can't happen because the history has changed they require you to fetch to pull or to to force push why do they say that they say that because the base doesn't take everything that has was here and put them on here no it leaves them here but creates an entirely new history that have the same contents as what was here and places it on top of this this stays here stays here until a garbage collector runs and collects it as the garbage and those objects that you have there you had it there they become unleachable if that happens and garbage collection is something that is common also in other languages so uh, with a few minutes i have let's try to see how that would work so we've committed something let's go back to master okay and um and add the file in master we create it in a file that is called the master.txt okay we add it and we commit it added file in master so if we do git log we see that the master is here and we have another branch branch two that is at a different commit so we are going to mm, let's rebase them let's rebase them instead of this so let's take note of these commits let me take let's take note of these commits this is one commit let me open notepad and put it here this is the commit in master okay and we are going to switch to branch two and do git log 
and take note of this one also. Okay. Okay. And let's the base branch two. Okay, and it's up to date. So let's switch to branch two master and try to rebase okay we've successfully rebased and we do our git log and you see what we have is totally different from what we had so these commits are totally different so let's check out one of them let's check out other file in master cut file what is inside okay <sighs> okay we take this commit of added cut file it with option of p And you can see everything about it. It's the it's the this tree, it's everything. And if we take this one also, we cut file it. You can see that we are getting the same things. But we have two different commits. So this is what Libase did. Took this commit, copied it into another different commit and pressed it on top of master this is still here because it wasn't garbage collected but in the future it's going to be garbage collected and we can't be able to retrieve it okay so this is about the base okay so i guess that is uh, today's portion about git internals with the time that we have so time for what is the following, Three. Mr. Um, Paku. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for the... Please, search can mute. Banamaya. Okay, cool. Banamaya. Oh, German, can you mute your mic, please? Good. So thank you for, for the, the presentation. I think it is a good um, session. So do you can do anyone has a question to ask about what okay okay we have a hands okay what's you you have a mic okay yeah okay thank you thank you thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to ask my question first of all Kevin thank you thank you very much and through your presentation I realized that I don't know anything about Git. I'm just beginning, I'm just starting with Git. Like, I'm just joking with Git. So, uh, especially, uh, let me, oh, I have another meeting. Okay, uh, I'm just distraught. Okay, um, my question will concern, uh, it's not about the presentation I've learned, and I hope you will send out the PowerPoint to dive yes, deeper into some of common you you talk about in the in the presentation and my question will be about uh, maybe we will talk about it in the next like another presentation how to become a campus expert or github campus expert something like that so i don't know if you maybe we can schedule it for another meeting and talk about it once again yeah. thank you Okay. Oh, thank, thanks a lot. Thanks a, lo a lot. Uh, I really appreciate that. We can totally schedule a call about that, but you have okay. to be, a, a, a in a nutshell, you have to be a student, you have to be a community leader, you have to be willing. Those are the prerequisite of you need, and then we can schedule a call and talk more about it and the processes that you go okay. through and everything. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I'm, I'm already a GitHub student, so... And um, yeah, also, and I'm also an MLC, so I think hope that one can help to to become a spot like you. 
yeah it's, it's sure he can help sure he can help and a lot of other things if we you can reach out to me also on LinkedIn or everywhere I can give you more detailed okay. information about uh, the process. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, we will. Okay. We have Chesco. Chesco, you can you can open your mic. All right. Thank you, Paku. Uh, Kevin, that was a great presentation. Uh, well done. Uh, Actually, uh, Git is not my thing, <laughs> to be honest. I always hear it. So learning Git is, is, a, is a beast for me. Sometimes I always dodge it. I do the primary one. And go, Alvin, please uh, don't laugh at me. <laughs> it's a true fact. Let me just say it clear over here. Um, so I wanted to know, uh, when is the best time to use a re re retake and then um, the other one? The, I forgot the the other one you called the first one and then re, re, re match or retake right rebase sorry you have rebase, uh, rebase and, and merge merge yeah yeah so yeah, yeah, me, yeah. every time I get I get lost so what I do is like I just download the whole repo and I put it somewhere and I do my own work <laughs> so please uh, can you explain me that thank you yeah yes so uh, they are both important it depends on the character of the development team that you are working in. Rebase is great for history. If you have to keep clean history, you can use it. But also if you are collaborating with someone and you Rebase and you push, they are going to get totally something different. So if you don't want to disturb them, if you're working with a big team, then you can merge when you don't care a lot about history or having a lot of commands. Because, because merge commit is going to have a merge Merge is going to have a merge commit. So whenever you merge, you're going to have one additional commit. So if you merge uh, seven pull requests, you're going to have seven merge commits. If you merge 10, you're going to have 10 commits. But with the rebase, you aren't going to have any additional commit. So if you prefer that I can have these additional commits and be able to pull everything without hassle, then go with merge. But if you have to have if you want to have a clean history, you can use Libase. And you, a lot of team uses it so that one developer can have his branch that he's working on and he rebases everything since he's working alone. And when he's able to, he, when he, the work is ready to be put into the developer or another main commit that they use, then it is merged. A combination of two is used. So that, that is what I would say about that, Mr. Tsheko. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I understand. And so uh, if let me let me try and make it clear. Uh, uh, rebase is like you are working on your own side, trying to find out some things. And then once once you are done, you send it back to Mesh, right? Yes, yes. OK, OK, perfect. Thank you. OK, thank you to, to Tesco for the, the question. I think we have success. Success have uh, has any, any question? Success, are you here about us? No, okay. Okay, good. Do I think that anyone, it, it, we don't have any question. So please don't forget to share. Yes, uh, Kevin. You will share uh, the the PowerPoint with us, right? Yes, I will, I will, I will make sure um, to uh, adjust the permissions and share the slides with you. Okay, okay. You can share, share it in the in the chat. Everyone can see it over there. Good. I think that we we will close this meet if we don't have any question again, or if we have any comments to add or uh, anything to, to to add or uh, some some words to appreciate the presentation we we are open to to hear about the person okay okay thank you for ev to everyone to for joining now we will move on the next meet for for the the, the presentation it is for another presentation. So uh, thank you, uh, Kevin.
Uh, Paku, sorry, mm -hmm. Paku. Yes. Yeah, sorry, before you proceed, uh, Kevin, are you, are you staying throughout the uh, uh, admin presentation? You are muted. Uh, I have something that I'm going to jump to, so unfortunately, okay. I won't okay. be able to. No problem. So I would but like everybody have to recordings. come on camera. Yeah, I would like everybody to come on camera so you take a snapshot for that before you, you, you leave the conversation. That's why. Yeah, yeah. So, Paku, if you can, if you can, I let everybody to come on camera so that you take a picture, like, you know, some um, family picture, something like that. Please. Okay. I'm okay. coming live. Yeah. Okay, good. So, everyone can open the camera for family picture. Everyone to meet. Good. Avin, I hope you are there. Avin. Okay, I, mean, I see what you, Germain, success, Avin, Serge. Don't be shy, guys, don't be shy. Totally not shy. <laughs> Nobody should be shy here. We are all learners. And if you don't know Git, it doesn't matter. We have the expert here that taught us and he's willing to help us throughout. You can just contact him on LinkedIn. And those who don't know uh, or who don't have uh, Kevin Hando, you can just type his name, Rekondo Kevin, on LinkedIn, and then you will find him. He's very uh, live active over there. And he's based in Rwanda, you know, right? Now the family is growing from the West Africa. We reach far, 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 far away already. Thank you, guys. Uh, Avin, Avin is not in there. Okay. I think she said she cannot join us because she are not on a good position. I'm not in a good position. Okay. But I hope she can present though. All right. So I believe she cannot come on camera. That's what she mean. So that's fine. Um, our background is not nice though, but you open up, you own our camera. So I mean, never mind. Um, let me quickly try and do, uh, but you can you do a screenshot of this? I see my PC is freezing. Yeah, I can do it. Okay. So I think I've taken some screenshots already too. Yeah. I've taken a screenshots already. That's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, I believe that's okay now, right? Okay. So we can okay. off our camera now. And Kevin, thank you. And then talk to you soon. Okay, I'm going to share the slides so okay. <laughs> nice good luck with the next session. Okay, okay, please, everybody, can you give a shout out to Kevin for joining us and presenting with us today? A shout out to Kevin. Good, thank you. So, all right, right Paku, uh, uh, you can take over now. Okay, okay, so uh, Kevin is over there. Kevin is ready. It's not Kevin, it's Alvin. Ah, Alvin. Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm ready. It's Alvin, not Kelvin. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, we will move. Are you ready to, to share your screen? Um, yes, I am. Okay, okay. So, uh, welcome again to everyone. And now we will move on the next presentation to, to talk about, uh, about computer networking with Azure with our MLSR Alpha, uh, our Alpha MLSR Alvin. And now I will, I will give the floor to Alvin to, to, to go away. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paco, for the floor. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Microsoft user group Lume for organizing. Um, I'll just share my screen now so that I can start. So please just give me a minute so I can share my screen. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Yes. 
Okay. So, like um, <clears throat> they rightly said, um, Wunja Alvin, um, from Cameroon, and I'm a Microsoft Learn Student Ambassador Alpha, and a student at um at the University of Bermuda. So apart from being a student, I'm also the CEO and founder of Green Girls Into Tech. So I noticed that we don't have girls in the call. I don't know, are there any girls in the call? Maybe you could just react or something, or say a word. Yes, there are ladies here. <laughs> Okay, so Green Girls into Tech is a non-governmental organization aimed at empowering young girls aged 16 to 20 with tech skills because we notice that most girls don't get into tech or they are shy because they feel like tech is for men and all of that. So Green Girls into Tech is aimed at um, encouraging these girls and empowering them with the necessary tech skills so that they can get into technology. So apart from being a student, I'm also part of DJIT. So I'm so, so happy to be here today. And I'll be talking about computer networking with Azul. So these are the key topics that we are going to cover. We're going to talk about, we're going to have a brief introduction to Azul because I don't think everyone here is versed with Azul. We're going to also have we we'll also talk on key concepts in computer networking. We're also going to talk about networking services in Azul, and we're going to have some practical applications and use cases where companies use Azul to leverage their businesses. Then, of course, we're going to have a question and answer session. So without wasting any much time, now we are going to talk about Azul. So, what is Azul? What is Microsoft Azul? Microsoft Azul is a cloud platform that provides wide arrays of services, including computing, analytics, storage, and of course, networking. So why Azul in the first place? Why, why did I choose to talk about Azul? Why, did, why didn't I talk about um, AWS or other cloud services? Azul has some features that makes it stand out and makes it makes um companies and organizations utilize it for their businesses. The first is scalability. Azul allows businesses to scale their resources up or down based on their demands. For example, in um periods like holidays, companies can quickly allocate more resources and then scale back when the traffic decreases. So during holiday periods, we know that most um, people, for example, a company that sells goods and services, they will mostly um, scale up so that they can be able to provide these services to the public. And after holiday period, then they know that they don't have a larger market, they can scale down. So Azu gives them this opportunity to scale up or down. The other feature is um, cost eff efficiency. So with Azu, you can only pay for the services you use. The model is particularly advantageous for startups and small businesses that may not have the budget for large scale infrastructure. So instead of buying, um, infrastructure or equipment that you end up not using with Azul, you only get to pay for the services that you consume or the resources that you use. And another beautiful advantage is flexibility. So with Azul, you can access its services from anywhere, enabling remote work and collaboration across teams globally. So Azul services no matter your location in Rwanda, in Cameroon, anywhere you are, you can have access to these services. So Azul has other advantages, but I'll just be talking about these three now. Now we are also going to get into some key concepts in computer networking. Um, before getting into computer networking, I think I always sit and think about networking like 
one of the most important fields in tech because imagine a world without networking. Without networking, we wouldn't even have the opportunity to have this meeting now because why? We are able to have this meeting because of the internet and the internet is one of the largest networks. So without networking, the world would just be bizarre, no communication. If your relative travels to another country, that's all. You just need to write letters and networking has really solved a lot. So we are going to talk about some few concepts in networking. First, what is computer networking? Computer networking is the interconnection of two or more computers to share resources and information. So connecting two computers for sharing resources or information is computer networking. And networking is essential for communication and resource sharing in both personal and professional settings. So whether you're a professional or a, a or you, you, you still do networking in your personal settings or professional settings, yeah. So there yeah, are different types of networks. We have local area networks, popularly known as LANs. They typically cover a small geographical area, like an office or a campus, and they are characterized by high speed and low latency. We also have the one, the wide area network, which I spoke of, and it covers a much larger area, such as a city or a country. And I earlier mentioned that the internet is the largest of the ones. So without networking, without the internet, without anything, life would be boring. So I encourage anyone in here, especially the girls, if you are still looking for a field or a career path to pursue, I think networking is the perfect opportunity for you. So um, during communication, we have rules that govern communication from one computer to another. And in computer networking, these rules are known as network protocols. So network protocols are rules that dictate how data is transmitted across networks. The most common protocol suit is the TCP IP, which governs how data packets are created, addressed, transmitted, routed, and received. So understanding these network hit concepts and understanding the whole concepts of Azure will definitely help you to know how to leverage Azure in your networking business. So now we're going to talk about why we are here, which is how you can use Azure in networking. So these are some networking services that these are yeah, these are some networking services in Azure that can help you make your networking life way, way easier. The first is the Azure Virtual Network. The Azure Virtual Network is a service that allows you to create a private network within an organization. So you can provide, you can connect um, virtual machines, databases, and other resources securely using VNet. So VNet can also enable you to control IP addresses, DNS settings, security policies, and route tables. Let me take an example in an organization that has just one floor and they have other, um, other, field yeah let me call them fields in the organization but they have just one floor where all these devices are stored and this organization does not have money to purchase um a bigger room where they can keep these devices but each time there is um communication between these different fields there is always network traffic because Imagine these fields are the sales field and the accounting field, just these two fields. And these fields are connected to a single router and a single switch. Normally, information that is reaching the accounting field will normally reach the sales fields because they have just a single switch that they are connected to. Now, this organization cannot afford to buy another switch because they are just managing or they are just a startup. So this is where virtual networks come in. With virtual networks, you can um, connect these computers to specific ports 
on your switch. So you can dedicate a particular switch to a particular virtual network, a particular switch to a particular virtual network without needing to buy any equipment. And it makes managing the network way, way easier. So we should really do much research on this Azure virtual network is very, very important for organizations, for startups and more. So the next will be the Azure Load Balancer. The Azure Load Balancer is a service that distributes incoming traffic amongst multiple servers. So this often happens most of the time when um, I'm in school and our results are published. And they usually publish our results on the school website. And so everybody has to access that website to get their result. But during the results period, there is a lot of traffic. And so only a few people have the opportunity to access their results at that time. And so other people can maybe only have access to their results after three days or four days when the results were published ever since. So with the Azure Load Balancer, it helps you to, it helps you as a network engineer to distribute incoming traffic amongst multiple servers. So we have multiple servers. This, this avoid overwhelming of the servers. It avoids just one server to become overwhelmed. So it helps to reduce traffic and congestion. So as a Azure Load Balancer is a very, very important service that Azure offers too. We also have the Azure VPN Gateway. The Azure VPN Gateway establishes secure connections between your on-premise network and Azure. Yeah, I know that we can be asking in our minds that can you have an on-premise network and connect it to an existing network on Azure? Yes, you can, of course, using the Azure VPN Gateway. So it establishes a secure connection for that matter it has other uh, features like encryption that helps you to keep this data safe and only for the only for authorized users so this is particularly useful for companies that operate in a hybrid cloud environment allowing them to extend their existing networks into the cloud so and the last service will be the azure express route the Azure Express Route is a service that provides a dedicated private connection to Azure by passing public internet. So it's ideal for businesses and it's ideal for businesses that require high security and reliability for sensitive data transmission. So each of these services play a vital role in building networking strategies with Azure. So if you're a network engineer and you're not using Azure, <laughs> I think you're missing out on a lot. So we're going to talk about some practical use cases that businesses apply these Azure services in real world scenarios. The first is e-commerce. Online retailers use Azure to handle secure transactions and manage vast amounts of customer data. So in big organizations that customer data cannot be managed ma manually, these organizations use Azure to uh, manage this customer data and securely for that matter, because we don't want to, we don't want to play with customer sensitive information. We also have in healthcare, healthcare organizations leverage Azure for secure sharing of patients' data across networks. Also in hospitals, we cannot afford patients' data to go out, especially sensitive data. Imagine someone with HIV. Yeah, HIV, people with HIV are mostly uh, looked, at, looked at as outcasts, can I say that? And so imagine the data of somebody with HIV going out to the general public. A lot of people, like a lot of things can go wrong. So healthcare can not really afford to expose customer data just like that. So most of them use Azure to keep this data safe. So 
the benefits of using these services is to improve efficiency and it really reduces cost. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, any contributions from somebody in the crowd that knows about Azul or networking, we are open to hearing. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you too. So, um, do we have any questions about the presentation? Okay, we have Chesco. Chesco, you can take a floor. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think that was a sharp one. Um, my question goes to this. Um, how can you convince someone? You know, we are in Africa and you know those kind of services. We in our head think that is expensive. You as a as a, an Asia uh, specialist, how can you convince that customer to be able to move his uh, whatever service is doing that is on prem or wherever and that you think is not secure to Asia? Okay, thank you, Chesco. Yeah, it's true, we are in Africa and people will find it really, really difficult to believe that um, they should leave their on-premise networks and go to Azo. So I think I mentioned earlier that with Azo, you pay for what you consume. So I will convince this customer that instead of you buying a lot of equipment or infrastructure and end up not consuming them why don't you go to something that you will only pay for what you consume and and people africans don't want to waste money obviously and so <laughs> i think this would be a very good strategy to get africans into azu i don't know if i've answered your question yeah nice nice thank you and the second one since um you like encouraging ladies, uh, though ladies are not in the call here. Uh, what message can you send to ladies concerning Azure or their um, this cloud computing uh, career? What what message can you send to ladies about this? Okay, unfortunately, there are no ladies in the call, like you said, and I'm feeling shattered <laughs> because. I love encouraging ladies. And when I come into a tech setting and I don't see ladies, I really feel like we are left out. So the message I want to say to ladies is you can do this. Most ladies don't get into tech as a whole, don't get into cloud computing as a whole because they feel like it's difficult. They feel like it's vast or it's complex. I think I posted um, the flyer about this event on one of my social medias and a certain lady reached out to me and she was like you are strong you're powerful and it got me really emotional because I know that all ladies can do this but we just see other ladies who are into tech as strong and powerful bringing down ourselves so I want to tell every lady out there you can do this, you can do networking, you can do cloud. If you don't want to code, coding is for everybody. But if you don't want to code, then you should consider getting into cloud computing or networking. It is an excellent field. I think we we, we do networking in our day-to-day -day lives. These events will not take place without networking. As so networking is a very, very important field. And I'm encouraging everyone, even if you don't want to um, pursue it as a career path, maybe you should just learn about it to understand how things operate, to understand how you can be in um, Lome and I'm in Cameroon and we are communicating. So I think networking is an excellent field, especially for ladies. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I love the spirit, the power that is in you that continue to uh, drive this towards uh, your goal. And I just pray that uh, God keep you safe in this so that you can continue your, your the good work that you are doing and continue to empower other ladies to also take that path and then uh, empower Africa in whole so that every lady in Africa will know that tech is not actually for men, it's not actually for the strong, but it's actually for everybody. Thank you very much. Um, Baku, to you. Thank you, Chesco. Um, 
Thank you, Jesse. Good. Amazing. So, do we have any question against or a, an appreciation? No. But we, ha we have many persons in in this meet, but they don't want to, to speak. Yeah, that Faku, is... they, they are feeling shy, I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, so Success is not a shy person. Why, why okay. are you your mic? Success. Mic, say anything. Let's open your mic and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a shame person. Okay. Yeah, but Alvin, I want to know. Sorry, Paco. I want to ask a question to Alvin. Uh, why, why are you interested in Asia? Literally, because uh, when I first contacted you, you talk about gates. I was like, okay, that is a stop. But, but I see you now jump into Asia, where and then you yourself you say people know that that is the, the the tough one. Why do you jump in Asia? Do you want like to empower others? That's why you you choose the career path, or on your normal daily job, you don't do Asia. Okay, just go. Thank you for the question. Actually, I'm into Azul because I love easy stuff. I don't like stress. <laughs> so with Azul, I, I explored the services in Azul and I saw it really, really amazing. I didn't want to talk about Git again because I noticed that a lot of people were already so much aware about Git, but many people were not aware about Azul. But after Kevin's presentation on Git, I think <laughs> his presentation was really, really necessary because there are a lot of things that I myself, I learned from his presentation. So that's why I, I think Azure is, is really, really powerful and many people should leverage on it. Not only Azure, but cloud services as a whole, they make life really, really easier. And I think it's good. Okay. Thank you very much. Paco? Okay, that is, that is good. So we have any question from Daniel Ameninu in the in the chat. Uh, Daniel says that, um, asking that, how to become a student Microsoft Azure? And okay, I think he's yeah. asking about how to become a Microsoft student learn ambassador because as an ambassador you have all these advantages and you are exposed to resources and courses where you can learn as well. So I think he, that is his question and I can see go free in the call. I think he's the best person to answer this question because he's a gold ambassador. So I want go free to answer his question please if he doesn't mind. Yeah, I don't see Geoffrey. I think he left the call later on. Yes, okay. I think that Geoffrey has more. Okay, so I think to answer his question, if you are already a Microsoft Learn Ambassador, then we have an advantage and we are exposed to resources about every field in tech. Yeah, I think almost every field in tech. And there are um, courses under Azul that you can follow and learn and maybe get, and yeah, get certified. So as an ambassador, you have these advantages. If you are not an ambassador, you can apply to the program and yeah, when you're accepted, you then have these advantages. There are courses on, on the yeah on the platform yeah there are courses where you can learn i hope i've answered your question okay good uh daniel is it is it ever... okay okay we have any question again yes you did okay okay thank you thank you for for the the question do anyone has any question again? No. Okay. 
Okay, thank you for for joining this meet, and thanks to Alvin for the presentation. We are we are very happy to 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 be there because we personally I have learned more things and newly things again, and I think that we can have any session again about uh, about uh, another subjects to to meet again and again to learn about new things so thanks to all of you and see you soon um before before you guys leave the call i would like everybody to give a shout out to uh aninoka paku he doesn't speak english though but he tried to handle the session today uh, thank you very much paku for for handling this and then we appreciate it and uh Avin also uh thank you very much for joining and then uh, be part of us today thank you guys and then uh, see you bye thank you to